knowing that nearly 100 people are waiting for cake is <laughs> uh, an unusual degree of pressure. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Uh, I know and you know that you're here because of Laura Fry Research Centre, not because of me. Uh, and it's a privilege for me, not for Nora Fry Research Centre, to be involved with this evening. Um, 25 years is a long time. Um, and I can say that with total authority because my daughter turned 25 this June. Um, and it also seems like a very short time for the same reason. The years pass so very fast. Um, and it's really good to have opportunities like this one uh, to stop uh, and to take stock and to celebrate what's been achieved. Um, back in 1988, I was at the start of my own academic research career. Um, in fact, I was talking with people in Bristol back then, people like uh, Ian Popperwell, a social worker who many of you will know. Uh, Paul Abberley, the late great Paul Abberley, a researcher at what was then Bristol Poly, putting me right on disability. <laughs> And it was a really exciting time in the disability movement. Within a few years, we got uh, Mike Oliver's uh, Politics of Disablement, uh, Jenny Morris, Pride Against Prejudice, really important books. Um, and it was really important years of struggle when we were campaigning, as many, many people in this room will remember better than me, uh, for anti-discrimination legislation, uh, direct payments for independent living. Um, and I want to be a bit controversial, and I want to say that in, in the years 95, 96, 2005, around that time, we got a lot of what we were campaigning for. I remember coming to uh, Bristol to speak at events for Avon Coalition of Disabled People, yeah. Avon Co uh, Centre for Integrated Living, yeah. that obviously became West of England Centre yeah. Coalition. Um, I remember interviewing activists who'd been campaigning hard up to yeah. many years ago and were now suppliers of community care services to the disabled citizens of Bristol and Avon. A really extraordinary turnaround. Um, so notwithstanding the difficulties that disabled people were still experiencing back then, I want to say that for the first 10 years of this century, I think we achieved a high watermark for, for disabled people. And I want to say, and you can argue, and I don't want questions, I want challenges after I've finished, and I'm sure I'll get them, looking at this audience. I want to say that at that time, Britain was the best place in the world to be disabled. And you might disagree, you might say, what about America with the ADA, or um, Americans with Disabilities Act? Or you might say, what about Scandinavia with all their wealth and the welfare state? But I think the combination of good laws, good health service, good welfare state, uh, good people, good activists, made Britain a damn good place to be a disabled person. Yeah. If you think of inclusive education, we were moving slowly in that direction, direct payments, accessible buses and taxis, the access to work schemes, civil rights, the disability equality duty, most of the key elements were in place. And I can say that partly because I spent five years working at the World Health Organization and I've been to dozens and dozens of different countries where it's a lot, lot worse than we could ever dream of. And of course, don't forget the role of researchers like Mike Oliver, Colin Barnes, Jenny Morris and colleagues at Nora Fry right here in this city in generating the evidence and the arguments which help win those key policy battles. Whether that was anti-discrimination legislation, or direct payments, it was research which made the case, which changed the laws. So that's why I think that maybe 2010, let's put a number on it, may have been a high, a, I wouldn't say the, a high watermark of provision for disabled people. And maybe, you know, you might not have thought that three years ago, but then you didn't know what was about to hit. <laughs> and since then we've had the full impact of the global financial crisis, and the cruelest imaginable government in this country, yeah. whose austerity yeah. policies have affected disabled people yeah. more, more than any yeah. other group. I mean, you know, m many, many people hate the government, but disabled people have better reason to hate this government yeah. than yeah. any other yeah. group in society. Yeah. The Centre for Welfare Reform calculates that in England by 2015, 
Spending on social care for children and adults will have been cut by eight billion pounds. That's a total of 33%. Benefits for disabled people and the poorest people in society will have been cut by 18 billion pounds, or 20%. So savage cuts that we're all very familiar with. Looking at the, the total impact of all those cuts, people with the very severest disability, who make up 2%, 2% of the, of the English population, British population, will have borne 15% of all the cuts. So 2% of the population, the most needy people in the population, have borne 15% of all the cuts. So, you know, the Tories, they may be progressive about gay marriage, maybe a few other things, but they're still the nasty party when it comes to us and our people. So, now is not the place, I'm not the social policy expert, I'm not going to go into all the reasons and the arguments around that. Maybe boring. you can help me with that. And it's boring, as it says. Yeah. Um, but you won't be surprised if I say a little something about the, the conceptualization of disability that's relevant both to the, the good story and the bad story, the two sides that I've, I've given you uh, so far. Um, and forgive me if you've heard all this before, but I think it is interesting, because I think that the dominant disability rights approach built on the social model, which high, the highlights that disabled people are disabled by society, uh, not by their bodies. So the goal of policy in this approach is to remove barriers so that people can participate. Absolutely, absolutely right. And in that approach, uh, accessibility, uh, change of attitudes, anti-discrimination, uh, the sort of training of medical of doctors that my old friend Mara Byron was doing here years ago, creates a level playing field in which disabled people can get an equal chance. So you remove the discriminatory barriers and we become equal. You create a, a level playing field. So there's an analogy there, either explicit or implicit, with other marginalized groups in society, with women, uh, black minority ethnic people, gay people, to say, look, it's a socially created disadvantage. We remove that socially created disadvantage, and then we're equal. We can compete. We can flourish. But this is where I want to stop you and say, look, I think we've got to think a bit harder. <coughs> For several reasons. <coughs> One reason, I came back from America, I was at the high-level meeting at the UN in New York uh, the other week. Now, America has, you know, the best anti-discrimination legislation in the world. But it also has some of the poorest disabled people. So it suggests to you that this sort of individual liberal model uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of indi individualist model has its limitations. Philosophers like Isaiah Berlin distinguish between negative and positive liberty. Um, so an infringement of li negative liberty is where I stop you doing something that you could otherwise do. So if we build this building and the only toilets were up the steps, then me and my friend there, we would be stopped from doing what we could otherwise do, which was having a win. Uh, similarly, uh, a century ago, we denied women the vote. They were stopped from doing something which were perfectly capable and entitled by uh, uh, natural justice to do. Long ago, we used to say that gay people were not entitled to express their sexuality. And until recently, we said that they couldn't get married like everybody else. Racist discrimination meant, means the black and minority ethnic people uh, uh, face exclusion from jobs and housing. And in the same way, access barriers and prejudice prevented disabled people from using public transport, entering buildings, or gaining employment. So when we remove those restrictions on negative liberty, we ensure that people get an equal chance, and that's why it's been at the core of the disability equality agenda. But what I want to say is that for some disabled people, while for some disabled people this is enough, while some disabled people can get qualifications and live independently and work in the open labor market, and if they don't have additional needs, they'll do fine if you remove the discriminatory barriers. If you look at people who are what we might call DDA disabled, that is they count as disabled, but they don't have 
um, restrictions on their functioning, they actually get employed better than non-disabled people. They're doing very well. So the analogy with race and gender works. You take away the discrimination and prejudice, you give people equal rights, they can compete with everybody else. And what I think we have with this government is that they have, to a certain extent, accepted that approach. To a certain extent, they've accepted what the social novelists have always been saying. They've said, OK, we've removed the barriers, now get out there and get a job, like everybody else. The coalition has said, it's going to say, we're going to treat disabled people like everybody else. That's what they asked for. So if they're still on benefits, they must be scroungers, mustn't they? They must be lazy, mustn't they? Because we've taken away the barriers, and they're still not working. So I think we're in a certain degree of a be careful what you wish for scenario. Because the other half of liberty is uh, positive liberty. That's what Isaiah Berlin called it. And to achieve positive liberty, this refers to the additional efforts that must be made to ensure that people can enjoy a good quality of life. Enhancing positive liberty is about guaranteeing that people who cannot work, or who cannot work full time, or who cannot work in jobs that pay sufficient, still get a good quality of life or people who have to retire early through ill health, or like many people impairments have to do, still get a quality of life. That's the additional investment you have to make to bring people up and to enable them to flourish. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. It's not just about removing the things that stop you doing what everybody else does. It's about additional investment to give you that chance of a good life. Um, and I think it's about recognizing the limitations that some disabled people have, many disabled people have, and will always have in any conceivable social arrangement. It's about recognizing difference. It's about saying, actually, we're not saying we're the same as everybody else, and therefore we don't demand the same chance. We're saying, get off our backs, yes, get off our backs, but also recognize our additional needs. <laughs> Uh, Marx said, um, from each according to their ability, to each according to need. And I'm one with Ralph Miliband in thinking that's a pretty good principle. <laughs> and I don't think that Nora Fry would have disagreed either. <laughs> so, I've been talking over recent month with Pat. You know Pat. She inspired Pat's petition. You've probably seen Pat's petition. It's loads and loads of folks who are being screwed by the welfare benefits changes. That's a technical term, screwed. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm blinding you with sociology. Um, now, her group are actually very concerned about the dominance of this social model and disability rights approach within the campaign over welfare reform. Because she speaks for people who experience the intrinsic limitations of their illnesses and impairments, not simply the discriminatory barriers of society. And as far as I can see, the folks at the Nora Fry Research Centre work with many of those same folks too. Um, I know that there was once a time when campaigners were saying that per folks, all folks with learning difficulties could get a job. And I thought that was very misguided. I'm glad we moved away from that. Because it seems to me that many people with learning difficulties can get a job. And we stop people with learning difficulties getting jobs. But by no means, all people with learning difficulties can get jobs. And if we have that approach, we are going to fail to support the people who are in greatest need. Um, so the statement that was put out this week by Pat's petition and Carers Watch, have a look at that. Because it says exactly what I believe firmly and what I've seen uh, from our research. So what type of academic research do we need in these times of crisis? I wrote a book a few years ago called Disability Rights and Wrongs. Um, and I've revised it and it's coming out uh, later this month. It's called Imaginatively Disability Rights and Wrongs Revisited. <laughs> um, and you may or may not have bought the last edition, so I'm going to save you the money of buying a new one um, for, by telling you some of, the, some, one of the things I've said there. Because what I thought because one of the criticisms that was made of the first edition, or when, they, when I was going to do the second edition, there was lots of criticisms made of it, and many of you may hate it, and, and that's fair enough, you're entitled. 
Um, uh, but some of my colleagues said, you want to say something about what they're calling critical disability studies or cultural disability studies, uh, because you should talk about that too. Um, so what I did at the start of the book this time was to make a, what you, a crude categorization of disability studies. And I'm not including the sort of traditional disability research in social policy or medical sociology. I'm including what I call, and many of us call, disability studies itself. And what I try to say is that I think we've got three options. And maybe, I, I've just realized, maybe I'm laying down a challenge for the researchers at Nora Pride to declare which camp they're in. But I, you could just say I'm wrong, and that would bypass it. First of all, you've got materialist disability studies. <coughs> Um, what my colleague calls the social creationist approach, which defines disability according to the strong social moral. Uh, people are disabled by society, not by their bodies. So that's folk like Mike and Colin Barnes and Carol Thomas. Now, I've already you know, given you a bit of a criticism of that approach. I think also as researchers, the problem is that it's very hard to operationalize. When you go out into the world to try and do a bit of social model research, what you find is, as soon as you put your microphone under the nose of the first disabled person and say, tell me about your life, they don't just talk about disabling barriers in society. They talk about the whole kit and caboodle. They talk about being exhausted. They talk about pain. Um, yeah, I'm so glad Liz Crow's in the room because she put us onto this years ago. Oh. They talk about being treated badly. They talk about the barriers. Of course they talk about all of that. But they also talk about their health, they talk about their feelings, they talk about their emotions, they talk about living with illness and all the rest of it. Um, because that's, that's what we do, we don't divide up our lives like that. So I think that's why I think that the social model is problematic when it comes to operationalizing, at least in qualitative research. And of course this approach is more about those restrictions of negative liberty that I was talking about earlier. And the final problem I have with it is that I think different impairment groups are different. I just picked up uh, David Abbott's work with uh, a young man in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Now, I I I'm very looking forward to reading that because I know that that group is going to be different from research groups that I've talked to. And I want to know about the specificity of their experience. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if you've got achondroplasia mm -hmm. or spinal cord mm -hmm. injury or Duchenne mm -hmm. or Down syndrome or whatever else it is, there are some things about your experience which are very distinctive. Yes, you're all screwed by the Tories, <laughs> but there are specific aspects of your experience which other people don't have, and which we need to look at closely in order to understand both how your health condition affects you, but also how disabling barriers affect you. Just one anecdote, if I may. I did a project a few years ago with people with restricted growth. And I don't know if you're familiar, but in the world at large, disabled people are more likely to be unemployed. On average, twice as likely to be unemployed. Mm -hmm. That's a good rule of thumb. It's not it's a bad rule of thumb, but you know what I mean. But if that's not the case for people with restricted growth. They're not twice as likely to be unemployed. They're actually employed nearly as much as non-disabled people. So if you just saw the headline, twice as likely to be unemployed, you'd be missing something about restricted growth. But then when you talk to restricted growth people, what you find is that they're employed, but they're employed in rubbish jobs. They're employed in the low-level jobs, the menial jobs, the office jobs, and they never get promoted. They get stuck at the bottom. So for them, it's not getting into work that's the problem, it's getting decent work. They have a sort of glass ceiling, like women might do, in that they're not judged worthy of promotion. So that's how discriminatory barriers affect them. And they have to retire early because their backs are knackered and their joints are knackered and they can't work anymore. So they're late leaving jobs in their 50s, not in their 60s. So that's how their physical health condition affects them. But we wouldn't see that if we just talked all disabled people as a big cohort of everybody. Sometimes you need to look at impairment groups and I think the um, materialist disability studies approach doesn't like you doing that very much. But it has, you know, I, I want to pay tribute to those researchers and that impact of that research in making policy change. So it's, it's good stuff, I just don't think it's the whole story. Secondly is what I uh, am calling in the book cultural disability studies. You could also call it critical disability studies um, or inverted commas disability studies. Um, and this would be folks who are influenced by post-structuralism and post-modernism. 
folks like Dan Goodley, good folks like Dan Goodley, Rosemary Garland Thompson, Rob McCrew. Uh, it's a social constructionist approach that explores discourses and representation and puts everything in inverted commas. These are scare quotes for folks that can't see my fingers. And it's like we talk about disability inverted commas, we talk about impairment inverted commas, we talk about social change, everything's a damn inverted commas all the time. <laughs> Um, and my problem with this uh, approach is it doesn't tend to generate much very useful research at all. Because you spend so much time talking about your living in burning comments. You don't get on to interviewing people. And, then, <laughs> and who would you interview anyway because they're not in categories now and they're all everybody and so you might as well just talk to your next door neighbour. Um, I find it very frustrating. I mean, it's very exciting. It, it's, it's, I love culture and yeah, I spend the day going around art galleries and stuff and I love thinking about stuff. So it's valuable, but frustrating. I remember there was a book recently edited by Robin Crew and um, uh, uh, Morrow um, uh, called um, An uh, 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 Anna Morrow, called Sex and Disability. And you understand, the book called Sex and Disability, you're going straight to it in the, in the bookshelf. Um, uh, and I, I wrote a book called sex, uh, about sexuality and disability back in 1996, so I thought, great, it's an update, we're going to hear more stuff about sex and disability, which is what I like. Uh, but we didn't. I looked at it and got increasingly frustrated. We just saw more stuff about books about sex and disability, or films about it, but not stuff about actual disabled people doing the sex stuff, which is what I paid my money for. Um, it was very obscure, very theoretical, and not about lived experience. Because I think that's what I'm interested in. Call me a voyeur. I've obviously betrayed my interests already. Um, I'm interested in what disabled people's lives are like, what makes them better and what makes them worse, and how we can change from one to the other. So, you know, you can see why I'm not entirely enamored with that approach. Uh, and the third option, uh, you know, I would like to call it critical realist disability studies. You might call it post-social model disability studies, or it might be called everybody else. Um, and what I'm talking about here is empirical research. We're going to go out and, and, and find stuff out. But we take into account all the dimensions of the disability experience. Um, the health condition, the psychological and emotional, the social barriers, the law, the civil rights, the culture, the whole kit and caboodle. Because for me, disability is complicated and it's multidimensional. Our lives have so many different aspects, from, uh, from whether we can get out of bed in the morning because of pain, to uh, can we get to the bus stop and on the bus, to is anybody going to give us a job, to are we going to get a, a welfare benefit that's going to meet our extra costs and keep us uh, uh, the wolf from the door, to can we vote, to are we represented in the media, it's everything. Disability is everything. So we need research that looks at all those different dimensions, not just about how society creates barriers, but also how illness and impairment create restrictions. Mm -hmm. Not just about other people, but also what's going on in our heads mm -hmm. and in our hearts, uh, and how we live our lives and, and how we struggle as individuals, as human beings. And above all, um, a just society doesn't just seek to promote negative freedom, i.e. remove the barriers, but also promotes positive freedom by providing the additional welfare spending and the support and the services which overcome the restrictions that sometimes our bodies and minds place on us and by doing so enable us to flourish. I use the word flourishing a lot. I like Aristotle, I like a march of I like capabilities. I like the idea of increasing people's freedom by enabling them to live better lives uh, to make better choices, to be heard, uh, to, to overcome the limitations of body and brain, of society and the environment. So reorienting disability research towards this sort of approach, this critical realist or post-social model approach, is not about selling out. It's not about becoming an academic discipline at the cost of engaged research. Um, it's about making a difference. Uh, it's about um, starting from where disabled people are at in all our glorious uh, complexity. There are a billion disabled people in the world, a billion. 
disabled people in the world. 15% of the world's population are disabled people. That's a lot of us with a lot of lives, and we want to uh, uh, represent that wealth, that diversity, uh, that humanity. <coughs> so we need more empirical work about, uh, about the lives of disabled people, the barriers they face, the needs they have, and how we, we can work at different levels uh, to overcome those restrictions and enable people to lead better lives. Now, I don't know where folk at Nora Fry Research Centre position themselves. They might not recognise my categorisation at all, and that's fine. But I do know that you're doing empirical research, you're doing policy-relevant research, you're working with where people are at, and that you're making a difference, a real difference. And of course, most of the research at Nora Fry has been with people with uh, learning difficulties. And I think they're a group of folks for whom the social model works even less well uh, than it does for those of us with physical impairments. So, I want to see disability studies encompassing the whole range of possibilities, the medical, the psychological, the social, the cultural, the historical, the legal. I'm currently working in a medical school at the University of East Anglia, and there's a whole lot of stuff about disabled people's inequitable experiences of healthcare as the confidential inquiry into premature deaths of people with learning disabilities has demonstrated so well, and that's come from Nora Fry Centre. I love the work that Beth Tarleton is doing with research and research with and support for parents with learning difficulties. I rejoice when David Howard and jo uh, David uh, Abbott and Joyce Howard did the work with lesbian and gay people with learning difficulties. And of course, over the years, I've followed the work of uh, Oliver Russell, Linda Wood, Kelly Johnson, and many others. And preparing for this talk, it's made me think, God, I missed a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> Ken Simons, I never read anything about Ken Simons. I mean, get out of there. Ruth Townsley, Sue Porter, Marcus Jepson, and all the rest of you. I can't name you all. But I do want to read all of the work, and I will, slowly but surely. Uh, because over 25 years, there's been a wealth of relevant, high quality research coming out of this unit, which is why you're all here. There's always been good people in Nora Fry, and that's what makes the difference. You saw me earlier scurrying around, picking up, I mean, I'm only here to pick up three papers in the back of the room. I've got a, 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 an envelope for now, a bag for I think that disability studies is a vital and fascinating area of academia. It's vital, because disabled people are among the most excluded and disempowered people on the planet. It's fascinating because there are such gaps in our knowledge of how people with disabilities live and think and the barriers that they face in every domain of life. And I'm really proud that disability studies, all of the authors I've mentioned before, has played a major role in challenging the oppression that disabled people face. And as we try to implement the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, that work of both gathering and sharing knowledge is more important than ever. And that's the other thing about Nora Fry Center, is that it's not enough to have really good quality research. You've got to make it available to people in formats that they can read and understand and appreciate. You've got to share your knowledge. A real good university, a good academic unit is open, is porous, has people in, and goes out to meet people where they're at. So, let me finish. Uh, 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 I've got a few more things to say. I want to give you four words to sum up what I think I'm trying to do in my work, and which uh, I think I see in the work of the Nora Fry Centre, uh, and might be helpful for, for junior researchers who might be here. The first word is commitment. Because research is not simply about building academic career, but should be about making a difference. So I'm fiercely in favour of academic independence. I'm going to research uh, and write what I think is right. Um, but, it, but I also want to be uh, connected and committed and in conversation and accountable. I want to contribute to improving the world, even if only indirectly. Otherwise, what's the point? And the second one is evidence. Because I think the work, particularly the social scientist, is to understand the world and share that understanding. Evidence is really important. 
not ideology, but evidence. My columnist said to me once that sociologists, at the end of the day, they only did three things. They, uh, we, we, I'll say, we count people, we watch people, and we talk to people. That's all we have to offer. And if anybody was sort of confused about what sociology is, that's all it is. Talking people to people, counting people, and watching people. Hopefully with their permission, all right, of course that is. <laughs> Sociological research can do harm as well as help. <laughs> That's all we have to offer. Fresh data about the world and a systematic analysis of its meaning and significance. And if policymakers and practitioners are to improve the lives of disabled people, evidence is vital. The next word is the word trust. Because we need to foster relationships between researchers and the disability community that are sincere and honest and open and respectful. I don't always agree with activists, and I know sure as hell they don't usually agree with me. We need debate and we need pluralism. We need to know that we all share that basic commitment to disability equality, and that we will treat the people we research with with respect. They're willing to spend time with us, they're willing to trust us, they're willing to uh, share their views and life experiences with us, and that trust must go both ways. And that's why also we've got to make those findings. If we're going to take up people's time, we've got to give back by making those findings available to as many people as possible. My last one is doubt. Because I think this is perhaps the most important thing if we're to get it right. Because I think the true scholar doubts everything at least once. I think we have to doubt what people take for granted. I think we have to doubt what people tell us, even if they're activists or self advocates I think we have to doubt ourselves, which means being reflexive and self-critical, and putting up our hand when we get it wrong, as we will. So, commitment, evidence, trust, doubt. I'm sure you'll have other words to join them. Finally, I couldn't stop talking without saying something about Nora Fry. Nora Fry was a Quaker. She came from that a great Quaker dynasty of chocolate and biscuit manufacturers. Well, you laugh, but you know why Quakers made biscuits and chocolates? It's because you can't kill people with chocolate. There is no such thing as too much chocolate. <laughs> they were hard-working industrial people, and they wanted to make money and be prosperous and make the best use of their talents. But whatever else they could think of doing, like making steel or digging coal or whatever, could be used to kill people, but not chocolate. And so historically, Bristol and York and Birmingham and Norwich, where I live, have these enlightening, reforming Quaker figures who have tried to make the world a better place. People like, more recently, Nora Fry. So I'm a Quaker myself, so I'm particularly proud that you've asked me here today to help celebrate your quarter century. I'm glad that you honour these Quaker reformers in the title of your centre. And there are many Quaker principles which are relevant to the Nora Fry Research Centre. But in closing, I want to remind you of two. And the first is, look for that of God in everyone. Now, you might not believe in an actual deity. I'm not sure that many, or any, or, no, that's not true. I'm not sure that all Quakers do. I'm sure they don't. So we need to take that word God broadly, metaphorically. In looking for that of God in everyone, we're looking for the good. We're believing in people. And that's why Quakers have a testimony for equality. Because if you look for that of God in everyone, Nobody is better than anybody else. Everybody deserves the same fairness, the same uh, access to flourishing. And the second principle is, uh, and this is a Quaker saying, but it's very, very common more broadly in Quakers, is let your life speak. Let your life speak. And to me, let your life speak is about the commitment to change which all good people and all proper reformers should have, 
and which I see displayed so well in the achievements. Tom, we've now got some time for questions. Mm -hmm. and oh, okay. Yes, we will we'll have, we will have some cake and so forth in a minute. Pauline and I have got microphones to bring round, so thanks, Pauline. Or challenges. Mark Williams here, thank you for your speech. Oh.